Trick or treat, smell my feet. The wind howled like a banshee, cutting through the silence of the black sky like a scissor. Boys and girls, even parents of all sizes, flooded the decorated streets. The witches in the house had scared many trick or treaters away with their creepiness, blood, and pranks, so they were bored out of their minds now, needing something to do. All right, let the dash, Amani said, waving a stick in the air and kicking her chunky black wedge heels off. She was forced to the side by an elbow, and a girl who was smiling from ear to ear took her place. Let the meeting begin, Rhea exclaimed, her arms in a jumping jack position. Her eyebrows withled like worms as she said begin, and she grinned. Rhea stumbled forward, tripping on the broomsticks against the wall. Her pointy black hat drooped a bit, like a sad puppy who got scolded. Girl, you gotta be careful, Kylie said, laughing and helping Adrian stand up. It was their fault, Rhea said, pointing at the broomsticks and sticking her tongue out at them. Wait, why are we doing this again? Bee's eyebrow cocked at the girls as she said. We saw each other yesterday. Rhea's eyes widened, and her hands went to her heart. B, I haven't seen you in five whole years. What are you talking about? She said, a smile appearing on her face. Amani gently smacked Rhea on the back of her head. I mean, we planned this, didn't we? Rhea rubbed the back of her head with her thumbs. Yeah, I know, B said, flopping onto the sofa like a limp doll. Okay, so the meeting has begun, now what? Kylie asked adjusting her witch's cloak as she sat down next to B. She grabbed a white pillow from the couch and cuddled it like a puppy. I don't know, we didn't plan this far ahead, Rhea said, laughing and walking over to the sofa. And honestly, I'm kind of tired of walking to the door over and over, Kylie said, sighing and fixing the fake blood on her neck. Well, do you guys want to watch Netflix or something? B asked taking off her black lace-up knee-high wedge boots and sliding them under the couch. Sure, Amani said, playing with the smooth, plastic mole on her face. Rhea looked at Kylie, and they nodded at each other, their lips pressed together as if they were trying to hold in a secret. Kylie got up from the couch and ran over to where the remote lay, on the wooden coffee table in the middle of the room. We're going to talk. Socialize. Rhea exclaimed, grinning. Fun, right, guys? A blood-curdling scream rang in the air, and Bee jumped up. What the dash? She exclaimed, tiptoeing over to the back door. A satisfying click came from the door as Bee locked it, turning back to her friends. Her eyes were wide open, and goosebumps formed all over her skin. This isn't funny, Amani murmured her lips parted in a nose shape. Bang! 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 Kylie struggled to stifle her screams as someone something banged on the back door as if their fists would never break. Rhea ran over to Kylie and hugged her, rubbing her shoulders. Her eyes were wide too, and her heartbeat pounded in her ears. Who's there? Amani said, glaring at the door. Silence. Nobody said a thing on the other end, not even when Amani repeated herself. Who's there? Bang. 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 Help, I need Dash. A woman's voice yelled, her fist sliding down the door. Her voice was high, and it sounded like sandpaper. Kylie's eyes widened at the woman's cry for help, and be shouted. Open the door! Amani gulped and nodded raising her shaky hand. The fake brass handle shone like glass as Amani reached for the lock and grabbed the handle. No one was there. Rhea let out a shriek as she saw what was in front of the door. A bit of blood flowed into the room, soaking Amani's socks. But she didn't care, she couldn't stop staring at the doormat. On the words welcome written in big, blocky, black letters was a body. A woman's body crippled up right against Amani's feet. Nobody spoke. The woman's face was twisted like a twizzler, her face distorted horribly. 
No. Close it. Rhea and B exclaimed, their eyes glassy. Amani nodded and shut the door, closing her eyes and taking a deep breath. Rhea sobbed and grabbed another pillow from the couch. Heartless, she muttered. Heartless. Why do people enjoy hurting each other? Amani walked over to Rhea and hugged her tightly. Kylie and B joined in, and they hugged each other for a while. Is there like a security camera out there? B asked Amani, her eyes red and puffy. Lines appeared on her forehead as if someone had drawn on it. I don't know, Amani said, wiping her face. Do you think we should give her a funeral? Kylie asked, glancing at the door. Rhea's eyes widened. I'm sorry I can't, she said. I can't with that. She shook her head and rocked herself, playing with the itchy, gauze-like fluff that hung off her black skirt. Yeah, and my parents rarely allow dead bodies in my house, Amani said with a weak smile, rubbing Rhea's back. Kylie nodded and stood up, walking towards the door. Rhea watched her, waiting to see what she would do. She opened her mouth to say something, then closed it as Kylie's hand neared the door handle. Click. Kylie locked the door, running back to her comfortable spot on the couch. Where are parents when you need them? Rhea asked, turning her head away from the door. Kylie shrugged and grabbed a decoration from the plane wall, putting it on Rhea's head. B smiled at Armani, Rhea, and Kylie, then her expression switched to seriousness. Guys, what are we going to do about the body? The door creaked open and the girls jumped out of their spots, startled. We're home! Amani's parents called, parading through the door with bags of candy. Their grins dropped as soon as they spotted the girls' expressions. What happened? We saw a dash. Amani started, running over to her parents and hugging them. B cut her off, her eyes wide. Scary movie. We watched a scary movie. Yeah, and Amani got a teensy bit jumpy. Adrian nodded, smiling at Amani's parents. If you know what I mean. Amani's eyes widened. Mom, look. She pulled her mother towards the back door of the house and unlocked it. The woman's head, which the door had supported, fell to the ground with a painful thump. Amani's mother stared at the body, her eyes wide. She turned to her husband, whose eyes were glued to the body. Then they laughed, doubled over, holding their stomachs for dear life, as if their guts would spill out at any second. Amani stared at her parents, trying to form words but failing. B cleared her throat and said, Excuse me, would you mind telling me why you're laughing? W.L. Amani's father let out a chuckle and he stood up straight, smiling at the girls. We got you. The end. Sparkly vampires are douchebags. What's your name? Ayatella. I stutter though despite my hiccup and breath, my voice is melodious and dazzling. And seductive too. But also virtuous. My fellow peers at the cafeteria table look up at the exact same instant. They blink simultaneously. They all lean forward to cup their chins in their hands. And then they lock their eyes with mine enraptured by my husky but smooth, alluring but righteous, enticing but noble voice. There's Ike and Skylar, who both stare at me unblinkingly. The young men have eyes only for me, drool dribbling from the corners of their mouths. Their saliva pools upon the cafeteria table, dripping off the edge and onto the floor, until their shoes rest in puddles of spittle. There's Jesse, too, who gazes at Ike. The knife she'd been using to smear cream cheese over her bagel sits clenched in her hand. Slowly, she swivels her head toward me while keeping her body turned to Ike.
until her narrowed eyes burn into mine. When I look in them, I see orange flames instead of pupils. She draws her index finger across her throat as she stares at me, jerking her head toward Ike, who continues to look at me, the saliva still accumulating on the floor. So, because Jesse indicates that my death is imminent the longer I look to Ike, I shift my eyes to Skylar. But Angelique looks at him shyly, eyes fluttering between the table and Skylar over 2,000 times in less than 30 seconds. So, I look at the ground, which seems to be the only safe site for my eyes to rest. They all look at each other for 2 minutes and 36 seconds, shifting eyes and looking up through their eyelashes and glancing away and not speaking at all, because teenage conversations often involve inscrutable and obscure scrutiny rather than actual human discourse. Eventually, they stop, and all turn toward the cafeteria doors, again at the exact same time. I look up. The lights in the cafeteria suddenly dim. A spotlight shines on the doors. An orchestra appears out of nowhere on the right side of the room and begins to play a slow-building, luxurious piece. Don't look, Angelique whispers. She looks wide-eyed at the doors, unblinking, mouth open in a perfect, oh. Five people walk through the doors. They are remarkably beautiful. Unnaturally so, in fact. Actually, they're just downright disturbing. Seriously. Like, what is wrong with them? Who looks like that? And how is nobody else in this cafeteria besides my table perturbed by their sudden entrance and sickeningly white skin and black eyes and ridiculous hairstyles? As they walk in, everything slows down. Damn it. I scowl sexily but virtuously as I try to wrap my fingers around my drink to take a sip of water, but they only move at a rate of one inch per second, so it is rather slow going. My scowl is elongated well into the next scene, in which I slowly lift my head once more to stare at the five individuals. But my eyes latch on to only one. He is the last of the five to enter the school cafeteria. I stare at him in wonder. Slowly, so slowly, his head turns, and despite the spotlight shining directly into his eyes, he stares into mine. My heart thuds in slow motion as we lock gazes. His eyes are pitch black, which should be frightening, if it weren't for his wonderfully chiseled body. Really, that's all I can look at, so it's no matter that blood drips from the corner of his lip and onto the floor, leaving a trail behind him. His biceps are sturdy and brawny. I have eyes only for the muscles underneath that sickeningly white skin, the color of which I ignore. And though his irises are black and he's dripping blood and his skin is disgustingly pale and he has the darkest bags under his eyes that I've ever seen and when he smiles I see actual fangs, it does not matter, because his body is just simply godly. The moment our eyes meet lasts forever. I never want it to end. And for seven beautiful hours, the moment goes on. We stare, and stare, and stare. Finally, the orchestra packs up their instruments, and the lights turn on once again. The five individuals sit down at a table. They sit with straight backs, not looking at one another, simply staring into space. And though they avoid gazes, I can see their hands rubbing each other's thighs beneath the table, which is perfectly normal so I look back to their faces. The one that stared at me grips his hand, the one that is not stroking the leg of one of the other men beneath the table, so tightly that I can see it shaking and trembling. His eyes keep swiveling toward me before he glances away just before making eye contact. It's not strange or creepy at all. Who are they? I whisper sexily but virtuously. The Sullens, of course. Jessie snaps at me rolling her eyes so hard in her head that I see the whites of her eyes before the flames return. Can you die now, please? The Sullens. So that is their name. The bell rings, and I stand up to walk to my class, finally ripping my eyes away from the godly man. And as I step forward, I suddenly trip over nothing at all, falling dramatically, the floor inching ever closer to my head. Suddenly, 
he is there. The godly man. He picks me up before I can hit the floor, swinging me into the air for a moment. He sets me on my feet. How did you do that so fast? I ask sexily but virtuously, breathless as I stare into his black eyes. Because I'm definitely not a vampire or anything. Just a regular guy, obviously. He says smoothly. Oh, of course. Can I suck almost all the blood out of your body until you're seconds away from death before I realize what I'm doing and somehow overcome my raw biological instinct? What? Can I walk you to class? Yes. I stare into his beautiful demonic eyes, ignoring how his lips curl, displaying sharp, pointy fangs. He leans down, inches away from my nose, staring down at my neck. I'm sure it's because he wants to kiss it. Okay, he hisses. He doesn't move. He simply continues to stare at my neck. And then he leans down and sinks his fangs into it. But it doesn't matter. He's just too gorgeous for me to care about such a trivial issue as my death. The End Chloe. Where do you think you're going? Daryl asked annoyed with Chloe. The hell away from you, she replied as she packed her bags. I'm done with your lies. You're a frickin' ass. Look. I'm sorry, he started. You damn right you're sorry. A sorry excuse for a man, Chloe stated. I can't believe it took me this long to figure that out. You can't go now, he offered. And why the hell not? She asked as she folded her favorite black dress and put it in her suitcase. It'll be morning soon, he reminded her. Don't give a shit, she retorted. Where will you go? He asked realizing that she was serious this time. None of your concern, she stated as she looked around for anything she may have missed. Look. I know you're upset, he started. Just stay the day. And if you're still mad tonight, you can go. I won't try and stop you. You ain't stopping me now, she stated and then she headed for the door. Daryl stepped in front of her to try and stop her from leaving, and she slammed him against the far wall like a rag doll. Daryl was up quickly, teeth exposed. But Chloe's teeth were bare, and she was ready for a fight as well. It doesn't have to be this way, Chloe stated eyeing him wearily. You're young. You'll find another. Maybe someone that will put up with your bull. I've had enough. Fifty years is enough for me. Just be glad I was easy on you. Daryl calmed himself and retracted his fangs. In reality, they were useless against another of his kind. And Chloe had age and experience on him anyway. She was right. She could have snapped his neck just as easily as she had tossed him across the room. She had over 600 years of being a vampire on him. He was a child compared to her even though he was nearly 200 years old himself. He was turned young and never really grew up. Chloe was over 800 years old and had lived through a lot. She was tougher and meaner than most. When Chloe reached the train station the sun was only 20 minutes behind her. Counter to what you may have heard or read in books and movies, vampires do not burst into flame and turn to dust in sunlight. Nor does holy water or garlic hurt them. Break their neck or decapitate them, yes they die for good. She made her purchase and was soon heading west. She had closed her eyes and put a finger on the map. Minnesota her ticket read. She settled back into her seat and slept the four hours that it took to reach Minneapolis. When Chloe reached the station she gathered her luggage and bought a map of the state. 
She walked into the station coffee shop, ordered a large black coffee and sat down to study the map. She sensed the presence of others, some turned to look around but failed to notice her. She had years of experience and time to hone her senses. An older man appeared, bought a coffee and before he left he placed the dime on Chloe's map. She sensed that he was strong. She picked up the dime and saw the name of the city that it had covered. Northfield. She searched her memory. Jesse James' gang sprang to mind. Why not? She thought. She taxied over to the bus depot and bought a one-way to Northfield. She checked into a hotel and then bought a paper. She searched the market for real estate. She got lucky and within a week she had found a 100-year-old manor that nobody seemed to want. It had sat empty for nearly two years and it needed some work. She bought it and quickly became a suburbanite. To all her neighbors she was Chloe Alexander, a 35-year-old actress. Beautiful beyond compare who just wanted out of the rat race and to settle down. About a month or so in her new home there came a knock at her door. It was Erica with a tray of cookies. Excuse the intrusion, she stated. Just thought that you might like some cookies, don't cha no? Thank you, Erica, Chloe stated, and then she smelled the blood. Come on in and I'll get us some coffee. Oh no. I can't stay, Erica offered. I'm right in the middle of making a batch of blood sausage for Thanksgiving. I gotta get to it, you know. What do you get your blood from? Chloe asked. If you don't mind my asking. Not at all, she replied. The butcher shop can get anything you need in this town. You like blood sausage, do you? Yes. It's been a long time since I've had some really good sausage, though, Chloe stated. It was a long time ago in a small village in Norway. Well, you found yourself in a good spot then. Erica stated. Right in the heart of Scandinavian country. Lots of Norwegians and Swedes. I'll bring you some over when it's ready if you like. Well, thank you, Erica, Chloe said. I'd like that. Just as long as it doesn't short you any. Don't cha worry about that, she stated. I always make more than we need anyways. Okay. I won't keep you any longer. Thanks again for the cookies, Chloe said. You betcha, Erica said and then headed down the walk. Later that afternoon Chloe made her way into town and stopped at the butcher shop. It was difficult for her to remain calm what with all the fresh bloody meat in the display cases. She talked with Paul the owner and she told him what she needed and when. He assured her that he could get it and she bought a few fresh roasts and headed out. Another myth about vampires, they don't just live off of blood. They do eat regular food and get hungry just like ordinary people. Some time later Chloe was getting ready for Halloween. It was one of her favorite times of the year. She was a vampire after all and what better day to be herself and not have to worry about being found out. She had the obligatory decorations out in the front yard and a huge bowl filled with candies ready and waiting as well. That morning she got ready for the day and the subsequent night to follow. She put on a pair of black satin panties, black satin bra, black pantyhose and her black heavy satin corset. She normally didn't wear heels but for this night she stepped into her black leather knee-high stilettos with three-inch heels. She reached into her closet and pulled out her black leather dress. She had a custom made by a master tailor in the mid-17th century. It was well constructed and still looked great to this day. It was mid-calf in length with three-quarter sleeves and deep V neckline. She stepped into it and then laced it shut. She did her hair and makeup and was ready. She drove into town and did some last-minute shopping. The residents of the community were very friendly and welcoming. A stark contrast to the big metropolis that she had fled a few short months ago. She stopped by the hardware store and Andy came out to help her. Andy was sweet and very shy around women. 
Chloe sensed this the first time she met him. She always talked to him and not at him. She hoped that he would come out of his shell a bit more, and he was always polite. Chloe figured him to be about 16 maybe 17 tops, and he had helped her a lot with all the things she needed to fix up her old house. She noticed a few birthday decorations mixed in with the Halloween decorations also. Whose birthday is it? She asked Andy. Mine, he replied. What are you now, 17? She asked as she picked out a few items. 18, he replied as he showed her the better items to get. Legal now, Chloe said. You and your girlfriend going out tonight? I don't have a girlfriend, Andy blushed. I thought I'd go down to the VF. They're having a party for the kids. I think they're showing a horror film later as well. Sounds like fun. I'll be handing out candy, I hope, she offered. Don't expect too many kids, Andy stated. Why is that, Andy? Or should I call you Andrew now that you're a man? She asked. Andy's fine, he replied, still blushing. You bought a haunted house, you know. All the kids are gonna be too scared to walk up to your door. Well, the realtor never told me about that, she stated. Maybe I should put up a bunch of lights so that they don't get scared. That might help, he offered. It don't hurt now that you moved in either. Oh, really? You saying that I liven the place up? She kidded. Sorta, he said and blushed even more. I mean, now that there is someone staying there the stories about it being haunted should go away. It might take a while though. You may not get too many takers this year. Maybe I should change out of my costume then. Don't need a vampire answering the door at a haunted house, she offered. Answer the door like a normal suburban housewife. Oh wait. I'm not married. I need a husband or someone to play the part. You really want to go to the VF tonight? Andy turned about 50 shades of red that moment. Mom's taking my younger sister and brother so I should go and help her, he replied. I was kidding, Andy. I didn't mean to embarrass you, she said as they headed for the checkout. You really are sweet and cute. So are you, he muttered as he rang her up. You find everything okay? Pete the owner asked as he walked by. Did Andy get Cha what Cha needed? He sure did, Pete. He's a good worker, Chloe said and then she walked out. Chloe was beating herself up on the way home. You just got rid of one young guy and now you're looking at another? She thought. Daryl's an idiot, she countered. Andy's sweet. I can help him and he can sure as hell help me. Go to the bar and find some rebound dick. Don't mess up Andy's life, she thought. Who says I'm gonna mess up his life? She countered again. You turned Daryl and look what happened, she thought. He turned out to be a jerk anyway, she countered. It wouldn't have mattered if he was turned or not. He was and still is a jerk. He'd have just died a long time ago is all. I don't plan on turning Andy. That's just it. You never plan on turning them but it happens she thought. You get too emotionally attached. Even now, you're 876 years old and this boy has got you hot. I'm still a woman and I have needs, she countered. I'll limit my time around him so that he doesn't fall under my spell. That night Chloe had maybe a dozen kids stop by in spite of the fact that she had her yard well lit up to show that it was not a scary house. She made friends with as many neighbors as she could by baking cookies and bars and then passing them out during Thanksgivings and Christmases. Most of the middle-aged married couple's wives didn't like her because they assumed that she was trying to steal their men. She just ignored those and concentrated on the ones that wanted to make peace. When she did feed on blood, which was about once a week, it was on fresh animal kills or blood stock that she purchased from the area butcher shops. 
The residents of her neighborhood didn't realize it, but their lives were much safer since she moved in. Another myth. Vampires don't just attack humans because they want to. Perhaps in the Middle Ages when there wasn't any law around it became quite prevalent. Not so much now with technology. Vampires don't need as much sleep as normal people so they can patrol an area much like a security team could. Thereby keeping criminals away from the area. Occasionally she would sense the presence of others when she was out shopping but she never sought them out. And those that could, sensed that she was strong and was an elder so they never stuck around anyway. She always ate healthy and exercised so as she didn't age as fast as the normal people they assumed it was because of her healthy ways. She was for all intents and purposes, the quintessential suburbanite with her backyard barbecues and 4th of July parties that most of her neighbors enjoyed. No one knew that their neighbor was a vampire. The End <laughs>